Anyone who says that being a parent doesn't make you gain weight has never had to eat the leftovers from their kids. Welcome to Chatting with Casey with your host, Casey Palmer. Episode 8, we are the sum of our experiences. Welcome to Chatting with Casey, the podcast that's all about family, food, fashion, and faith, and travel, and tech, and everything in between that makes us who we are. I started putting this episode together deep in the interior of Algonquin Provincial Park, where I defied the tropes by backcountry camping with my brothers-in-law on scenic, windy Lake Opiongo. And while I'm absolute crap at canoeing, we somehow made it to a site to spend three days and two nights completely removed from the rest of the world, to the point where friends and family were texting and messaging to make sure I was alive. Thanks, guys. Love you, too. But it got me thinking about why. Why it was so uncommon to see black people outside of the urban environments we associate them with in every piece of media ever. It's not like black people don't travel. Look at creators like Heather Greenwood Davis, who contributes to National Geographic Travel Magazine, or the Carters shooting music videos in the Louvre. Black people camp, too. I get less strange looks as I roll into parks clad with gear with each passing year. Black people swim. Black people surf. Black people play croquet. It made me want to dive deeper into what's really possible out there, not just for black people looking to travel, but for everyone who's yet to find their place in the world without realizing just how big it is. And who better to tell me all about it than Ricky Shetty, one of Canada's original dad bloggers, and a man currently looking to make his family the first family to visit every country in the world. Ricky's no stranger to podcasting. I appeared on his digital Nomad Mastery series a couple of years back. So with a couple of bestseller books under his belt, when he prepared to put out the first volume of his latest series, Exploring the Continents, A Family's Journey to Visit Every Country in the World, he knew where he wanted to go to talk about it. Podcasts. But nothing's ever simple with me. For the minutes ahead, I grilled Ricky on everything about his life why he was doing this, what he hopes to get out of it, how it affects his relationships in his life. Though my experience traveling with kids has been routinely difficult, Ricky sees it another way. But I'll have him tell it for himself in Chatting with Casey, Episode 8, We Are the Sum of Our Experiences. Enjoy. So we're here with uh, Ricky Shetty, who is a very, very unique character in the world of content creation. Not because, not just because he's from a um, family out on the west coast of Canada, a Canada, country that doesn't have too many dad bloggers. Not just because he's been doing this for years and years longer than most parent bloggers have. It's because he is on a mission to have his family visit every country in the world. Not one, not two, every last one. And he's here today to uh, chat about that experience and his new book, Exploring the Continents, A Family's Journey to Visit Every Country in the World. Volume 1, South America. Ricky, how are you? I'm doing amazing, Casey. How are you doing over there in beautiful Toronto, Ontario, Canada today? We are great, thank you. Things are well. I'm, uh, as my listeners may be able to tell, I'm outside just enjoying our 30 plus degree weather. Uh, It's a nice, cool (laughs) June day. So, yeah. Well, I'm glad we're not doing this interview in December outside. Uh, You would be freezing your bum off. Yeah, man, I'd have to find a yurt or something. I'd have to figure out a way around it. But um, yeah, how many countries have you done so far? That is the first question I have for you. Sounds great. That's an easy question. I don't have to think about it. There's 80, I've done 80 countries on six continents, and I'm actually leaving tomorrow to Taiwan. I'm here in Manila, Philippines, and I'll be hitting uh, 81, country number 81 tomorrow, Taiwan. That is amazing. I haven't done nearly as many. Um, 
You know, I've been I've been able to travel a bit. I uh, climbed Kilimanjaro with my wife back in 2012. I did a bit of wet backpacking through Western Europe in 2005. Um, even most recently, I was in rural Mexico for a soccer tournament last summer. So you know, I try to go off the beaten path here and there. But it sounds like you've taken that up to a, another level entirely. <laughs> Don't forget, I have three young kids too. Just uh, throw that in there. There's a, I have a six year old daughter. I got a four-year-old son and I got a two-year-old uh, baby as well. So throw in three like, young kids and it even, uh, you know, uh, gets even more challenging if you want to call it that, uh, Casey. So what inspired I, I, what some would call madness? What inspired this madness? I don't, I don't think it's madness because I, uh, I'm of a very similar mindset in that I want my children to be global citizens. So I do want them to see as much of what's out there as possible. But uh, where did this gem of an idea start from? Yes, let's call it gem of the idea. That's much more pos- positive. <laughs> positive craziness, so positive madness. Um, So let me share with you that answer, which is a lot harder than the first question, Casey. Uh, So I'm from Vancouver, BC, Canada, as you mentioned, you know, a fellow Canuck just like you. Unfortunately, I don't support the Leafs. I support the Canucks. Uh, But other than that, that's okay. Fellow fellow Canadians, fellow Canadians. Uh, So I didn't actually travel at all outside of Canada, the U.S. and and India, which is my ethnic background, until my 20s. So up until my early 20s, I'd only been to three countries. Uh, So this whole journey began in my early 20s. What happened is I finished university and uh, I was kind of confused. What am I going to do with my life? I, um, you know, as you do when you finish university with a degree in psychology. Uh, so I ended up getting a job in Japan, taught English there. And then uh, I, I was so curious about uh, different cultures. I was like, this is so different living in Japan than it is living in Canada. So that really spurred this internal drive to see more of the world, learn more about cultures and languages and food and people and diversity. Uh, so from Japan, traveled around um, Southeast Asia, the typical, uh, you know, the route from uh, Japan to Korea to China, into um, Nepal, India, and then from India into Sri Lanka, then Bangladesh, Burma, uh, Thailand, Laos, Vietnam, Cambodia, Indonesia, Singapore, the Philippines. Uh, then my, I made my way over to Australia. Then I ran out of money, honestly, uh, after that Asia trip, <laughs> as you do. Uh, so I actually had, ended up having to work in Sydney. Uh, on a working holiday visa, which is a great uh, strategy for working overseas until you're 30 anyway. So uh, for any, any of your listeners who are younger, um, that's a great strategy. You can actually work your way around the world using something called a working holiday visa uh, strategy. So I did that in Australia. I ended up staying there three years. Then I ended up, uh, again, um, using the money I earned to backpack my way around Australia, staying in the couch surfing, um, homestays, uh, doing some dormitories and hostels. So traveling quite cheap. Uh, from Australia to New Zealand, then uh, ran out of money again. This is a common theme here, by the way. Uh, so ran out of money, ended up back in Vancouver, staying with my parents. And um, I'd also uh, become about 30 by this time. So I'd also done, I'd done Europe, by the way, too. I'd done Europe, Asia, Australia, and then I came back in my early 30s broke, living with my parents. That's not a good place to be, is it, Casey? You know, uh, no, I guess not. <laughs> my parents were like, "Well, oh, man, you know, you, you've seen the world, but you have no career aspirations. You're a bum, you know, uh, you know." Well, they didn't; they weren't that critical, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> they, they didn't say they never called me that. Um, but I felt like I was a bum. So what happened is I ended up uh, getting into entrepreneurship, Casey, um, because um, I wanted freedom. Obviously, that was one. That is one of my greatest values. I didn't want to work for the the man or the woman or the company. Uh, or the government or whatever. I know you're kind of connected to the government, so no offense there. Uh, for me, I <laughs> all good, all good, all good, all good. Uh, for me, I just wanted this uh, sense of freedom, um, and entrepreneurship promises that. But guess what ended up happening? My five first businesses failed miserably, and I was still broke. So um, I kind of wished I went back to um, you know a career with a stable salary. Um, and then finally, I started having some success. I started running event production. Uh, so I was running um, uh, conferences for two or three hundred people. I'd be making profit through um, uh, admissions, through sponsorships, through back end sales. I uh, started getting into internet marketing. Um, that's when I launched my blog, DaddyBlogger.com. Started making some money there. And then uh, around this time, uh, you know, like uh, right before DaddyBlogger.com, is when I met my wife. We had our first kid uh, um, soon after, and then uh, that's when I launched my blog. 
And then we had a second kid, third kid. And then this is where the actual answer to your question comes. Sorry, it took me a while to get here. <laughs> uh, no, it's okay. Yeah, so this is where the answer comes in terms of what prompted this uh, traveling with the family idea. So we had three kids living in a suburb called Burnaby, which is about 20 minutes outside of downtown Vancouver. And I was honestly quite discontent. I was going through depression. I was very feeling very uh, uneasy about the fact that uh, I would be spending the next 20 years of my life living in the suburb until my kids graduated. And finally, when I was empty nest, I could travel again in terms of long term, kind of not just a two week road trip. So I started communicating with my wife and I was like, honey, you know, um, in my 20s, as you know, I used to travel a lot. And now here I am, um, you know, like working as a business owner, but really not happy. Honestly, I was not happy. I was happy to some degree, but not fully internally, deeply, profoundly, you know, peacefully happy, if you know what I mean, holistically happy. Uh, so what ended up happening is uh, when we were going to have a third kid, as you know, Casey, they have an incredible system called Matt Lee Pay. <laughs> In Canada, we have one year pay for free leave. So I made the suggestion to my wife. I was like, why don't we travel for this year? Because you're still going to get your salary. You are going to have a whole year off. We already have uh, two kids, so you know we know what we're doing to some degree. And uh, I'm also working online, so I'll be uh, making, uh, you know, uh, I wasn't even making a full-time income, honestly, but I was making a supplemental income to my wife's full-time good salary with Best Buy. And then um, uh, she was getting about 2000 a month uh, from the monthly pay. I, I was getting about, you know, about 1000 plus through uh, my blog and through my uh, private coaching and my online courses. Um, and then we're also getting this child's benefits, like, you know, that's another 1500 roughly. So we're getting, you know, about 4500 a month. And um, we decided, why don't we use this money rather than just sitting in the suburbs and waiting until the mat leaves over? So that's what we did. We made a decision to travel the world for a year. And then uh, honestly, after that first year, we loved it so much. There were struggles and challenges, which we can get into. But we loved it so much that we've decided to continue, but at a slower pace. So we are now in the middle of the Philippines. And my wife's actually Filipino, so we're actually uh, spending time with her parents who live here. And we have slowed things down. Uh, we're going to be staying in Manila or the Philippines in general until probably December of this year. And then we'll be doing side trips. Like I mentioned, we'll be going to Taiwan for a couple of weeks and then, uh, you know, visiting other parts of Asia. So that, in a long summary, is what prompted the crazy adventure around the world with three young kids. But that's amazing, though. I mean, what you've kind of touched on is um, a few different things that really resonate with how I'm looking at this, because we get so fixated on a very specific path that we're supposed to follow when it comes down to career success and raising your family, you know, getting the house with however many, you know, picket fences and everything around it. Instead of understanding that I, I, one thing I, I often share with my audience is that, um, I believe that life is the sum of your experiences. We are the sum of our experiences. And if you don't go out there, uh, push the envelope, push, push your boundaries and really try to figure out what drives you, what makes you who you are. You're really not living your life to its full potential. So I have to commend you for that because it sounds like uh, with your wife and your children, you're all putting yourselves in a position where you can really get to that truth of who you all are. Yeah, I think that's what it's all about. And I, I'm glad I was very open about, you know, the lack of money and running out of money and even being very open about how much we're making and how much we need to spend and all that because uh, people generally feel travel is too expensive. We can't afford it. Uh, you know, we have to wait um, uh, until uh, we have more money, etc. But I, I think we're living proof that we as a family of five can travel with very, you know, little money uh, and still see a lot of the world and, of course, impact our kids and live our truths truths, as you mentioned, about being very authentic to who we are as people, living according to our values, living intentionally according to uh, the purpose we feel a God or, a, you know, like our, ourselves have defined for us, for our, our paths. And our paths. So, yeah, uh, yeah, we're definitely very intentional. Excellent. Well, I'm going to ask a uh, challenging question. You can choose to say pass if you want. But how does, 
your traveling affect the relationships with friends and family back home? Um, only because if you're not around that much, I know that people, you know, out of sight, out of mind often comes up. I have, find I found that was a huge thing that happened as soon as I started having kids that the nature of the relationships I had changed because I couldn't go out for drinks or whatever else anymore. So has it made things better, worse, stronger, weaker? What, what is, what's your take on that? There's no such thing as a past question. I'm here to answer any and all of any question you may have. So in terms of that question, you know, ironically enough, I want to actually uh, talk about the last two weeks. Um, so when I was launching my book, I actually created something called a book launch team. And my book launch team was mostly comprised of my family and friends in Vancouver because that's my closest network. I mean, the, I've known them for years on end. The friends I meet meet along the road. Um, they're very uh, shallow in the sense you ask the same questions. Hey, how long have you been traveling? Where are you going? Where are you going next? Where have you been? What's been your favorite country? Uh, you know, and you kind of ask those questions to everyone you meet when you're traveling. Whereas these friendships that I've uh, had in Vancouver are solid, lifelong friendships. So when you ask me, have I lost touch with them out of sight, out of mind? There is no such thing as out of sight, out of mind, because on Facebook, is, there is no such thing out of, out of mind unless the algorithms dictate that. So. <laughs> You know, uh, with Facebook, it's a beautiful uh, world in terms of the social media world because there's this incredible fusion between the offline, like me traveling remotely, yet being connected digitally um, to people. And people who comment and uh, engage with me on social media are still my closest friends from back home. So definitely uh, the connections are me, uh, solid. And in terms of what I was saying about the book launch uh, team, the people who really helped me in terms of giving me feedback about my book and helping me market it and buying my book are all these same close friends. So I wish I could go through them one by one, but just a shout out to the whole team who's really helped me and my friends. So even though I might not have seen them uh, for about a year and a half in terms of physically seeing them eye to eye, giving them a handshake or a high five or a kiss on the cheek, I still feel so connected to them. Uh, but at the same time, I just want to say this, Casey. It is tough. It is tough. It is challenging. It is a struggle to always uh, make friends, lose friends, uh, you know, uh, when we're traveling. So the lack of friendship and socialization is probably one of the biggest challenges to us being a nomadic family. And, uh, you know, part of the reason we came to the Philippines is guess what? We have family again. My wife's family this time and her aunts and uncles and her cousins and her siblings and uh, our, our um, children have kids to play with their own age. And uh, we're going to put them in a local school here. So in a sense, we're not back in Canada, but now we're in this whole new world, so to speak, a uh, brave new world here in the Philippines. And this is really good, obviously, for our kids to discover uh, their ethnic identity because they are half Filipinos, half Indo-Canadians. And we'll probably take them to mm. so they can understand the other half of their uh, you know, DNA. Uh, so right now they're learning about the Filipino half, and I'm sure they'll be learning about the Indian half in uh, a, a moment's time. Very cool. Um, so part of the uh, trailer for your book says that you're on a mission to become the first family to uh, visit every country in the world. Has your journey inspired any other families to take up the cause or have you met anyone in your journey so far who is doing something similar? No, no one's crazy enough to do something like that. And especially if you share it publicly to the world, including the podcast world. Um, so most people... Uh, I don't want to be judgmental, but I feel people think small. That when you think of bucket list items, they're like, I want to go to Hawaii. I want to go to take my kids to Disneyland. I want to go on a cruise to the Caribbean. Um, oh, well, yeah, you can do those things. But is that a, is that thinking big? Well, I don't want to just think big. I want to think the biggest possible. And even that's too much of a limitation, visiting every country in the world. I want to take my kids to space. You know, now that we have space travel, Richard Branson and uh, Elon Musk, you know, hey, if you guys are listening, you know, maybe sponsor us to go out there and uh, give us a review of SpaceX, right? So in terms of this big mission uh, to visit every single country in the world, what ended up happening there is um, I was looking at these people. Some would be wanting to be the fastest. Okay, I finished every single country in the world in two years. Some wanted to be the youngest. Um, and then I started um, researching. I'm like, okay, there's the youngest, the fastest, the first woman, I'm like, okay, what if, I wonder who the first family to do this was, because I'm a, I'm a family. wonder if there's someone who's done it. And then I, I Googled it, um, I, and, well, that's all you do, right, nowadays, Google it. And <laughs> I came up with nothing, Casey. I came up with nothing. 
really. And then I started asking people, uh, there's some communities called um, Every Passport Stamp or Counting Countries or the Traveler Century Club. People are into this kind of, uh, um, I was not going to say fetish, but I don't consider travel a fetish. But, you know, in terms of like, uh, people are so passionate about travel. Go with lifestyle. Lifestyle, that's a much better word. A family friendly word. Uh, in terms of like people who want to do something crazy, like visit every single country and every single territory, every single national park, every single province of every single country, like that people are just way out there and they want to do everything. Um, they want to touch every single land mass in the world. So I couldn't find, and I still, I don't, I honestly don't think it exists. So at this point, no miners have visited every country. So the youngest person who visited every country has been like in their early 20s. So that means my kid is okay. too. So we have like a good 15 years to accomplish this mission. I don't want to be the fastest. Uh, I just want to do it at our pace. Um, you know, we're looking for sponsors, obviously, when we really go stronger in terms of achieving it. Um, uh, but at this point, I just want to declare it uh, publicly because the more I declare it publicly, guess what happens? The more I believe it. Because honestly, even now, there's fears, there's self-doubts, there's like insecurities, like, can I really do it? Um, do we? Uh, is it really a good thing? And there's all these kind of my little voice saying, like the inner critic saying, "You can't do it. You can't do it, right?" But I got to defeat that inner critic by critic by declaring, "We will be the first family to visit every single country in the world." And even my book cover says it will be so. So the more I declare it, the more I believe it. So this is a general life principle. So if you have this big goal, writing your first book, starting your first business getting married, having kids, you know, maybe living as an expat in another country, you have to declare it over yourself and you've got to believe it so strongly that you believe it becomes a reality. Not in the new age, airy-fairy way, but in terms of the proclamation and then taking the actions to actually make that belief, that goal, a reality. So it's very action-oriented rather than like, let's believe it, let's sit in the house and then soon red Lamborghinis, Orange forces and bundles of money will show up at a door. <laughs> That's not going to happen. So you got to take action and not just believe. So yeah, hopefully those thoughts kind of help help and help you understand and unravel my big mission. For sure. I mean, it could happen. You never know. But move, moving on from that, I was thinking, uh, yeah, if you when you eventually compile this all into your final series. I was thinking you could call it "Around the World in Eight Thousand Days," but I found out that's already a book. So. We'll have to come up with a better title, but I'm sure you'll come up with something amazing. <laughs> I'm sure we will. We'll have to figure that one out. That's a good challenge. Uh, let me get back to you on that one. For sure. So I want to try and avoid the basic questions you hear all the time, only because having done a little travel myself, you do, and you, see, you experience this at a far more exponential level than I would, but you do end up getting the same questions all the time, like you mentioned, like, you know, where, where are you going next? What was your favorite place? All that kind of stuff. But I, my point with trying to have these conversations is trying to go beyond what you'd find in a simple, you know, TripAdvisor review or a Google search of, you know, National Geographic. I want to see what it is that sets one's mindset apart to do something that I'd have to say 99.9% .9 of people probably wouldn't consider doing. And, and that last 0.01% or 0.1%. Yeah, 0.1% because I could do math. Um, even then, with the challenge of doing it with three kids is um, massive. So here's a good question. How has it shaped your children? Because, you know, we have we, we, we see kids and we have these very regimented and not maybe not strict, but very structured ways of how they're raised and socialization and what they're around. What do you see in your children that is uh, perhaps shaped differently from the fact that they're getting all these experiences out there in the world? Yeah, and I'm glad you brought up this whole thing about uh, being asked the common questions because almost every single person will ask me, what's my favorite city? What's my favorite country? Where are you going to next? And I don't mind answering those. It's uh, Cape Town, a favorite city. South Africa, a favorite country. Where are we going next? Uh, Taiwan. Um, and in terms of that uh, kind of deeper question, which I love, Casey, I love people who ask me those deeper challenging kind of uh, questions that actually make me think. <laughs> so in terms of what you asked me about, how has this travel journey impacted our children? Well, it has changed their mind, it has changed their identity, it has changed their compassion, it has changed their understanding of the world. They no longer look at through the lens of a, a privileged 
Canadian family uh, who is rich relative to the rest of the world. We might be middle class for uh, Canadians, but we're rich compared to Asia. I mean, I'm just going to throw Asia into a big lump, but compared to most families living in Asia, uh, almost every single Canadian is going to be richer. Uh, same with Africa, same with South America. So I know these terms are all relative, but uh, I think you know what I'm trying to say here. So mm -hmm. our kids have really learned that the world isn't as rosy as it is in a suburb of Vancouver. Um, there's people who are in extreme poverty uh, just outside a condo here in Manila. There's kids who are begging at the same age of my kids, and they're probably going to beg until they become adults. Once they have kids, they're going to beg as well. It's a vicious, never-ending cycle of poverty. Uh, so in terms of, uh, um, you know, whenever we're traveling, we actually like uh, to give back, make a difference, and uh, volunteer. So we've been partnered up with a few volunteer organizations, including SOS Children's Village. So we volunteer at different orphanages. Uh, we uh, teach English there. We do arts and crafts. Our kids get to connect with uh, kids who have no parents, and they really get to understand that not every child has a parent. They, like most kids you ask, probably don't even know what an orphan is, let alone, uh, you know, uh, stay in an orphanage. So our kids have stayed in orphanages around the world, and they can quite clearly not only define technically what an orphan is, but actually uh, share their powerful experiences of staying in orphanages around the world. So our kids have learned um, about the great animals of this world, not through going to a zoo, but by going on an animal safari. They've learned about sharks from shark cage diving, not from an aquarium. They've learned about penguins by seeing them in the wild. Uh, so I feel they're learning about all the food. They're not just going to local restaurants like uh, sushi and uh, Chinese and Mexican, but they're learning about tacos by going to a taqueria in Mexico. They've learned about churrascarias by going to an actual churrascaria in Sao Paulo or Rio. They've learned about you know uh, all of this different music and culture. They've learned about languages. Um, you know, in Canada, we learn, we learn English and French as a default. Well, now we're going to be learning Taiwanese as of tomorrow, Chinese, right? Uh, when we were in Latin America, they were learning Spanish. So my daughter's not fluent, but she's conversational in Spanish already. So I feel there's so many practical benefits of travel that no school, no teacher, no classroom in any place in the world can teach them. The only place that can be, that can be taught is through real-life travel. And I really feel... The world is the classroom, and travel is the best teacher. That is an amazing way to describe it. Um, I think you're right in that, you know, they're, they're at an age where they're so malleable and they soak in information like sponges. They're not bringing their own, uh, I'll, I'll call them their own prejudices and stigmas and their own viewpoints that are shaped from years and years of growing up in one specific uh, mindset, one specific environment to the table. They are taking little bits and pieces from everywhere around the world to shape how they look at the world, which is probably the best way to uh, take a look at everything going on. And also, I, I would think that, you know, through the volunteering aspect and through being able to see so much, you maybe just end up with a more compassionate human being in general, which, you know, who in the world is losing from having more people like that? So that's amazing. Yeah, you know what? Kids are going to be way too compassionate. You know, that's a bad thing. <laughs> we better work on making them more selfish. <laughs> no, no. I think you guys have done amazingly so far. Here's, here's a more selfish question on that point, though. So as a fellow dad blogger and creator over here, where do you find time to capture all this and put it together? Are you relying more on the memories and making sure that you'll be able to go back later and say, you know, remember that time we did A, B, and C? Or are you uh, capturing it all, archiving it? Have you had any, you know, huge issues with uh, storing your memories and losing it as you go from place to place, things like that. Ironically enough, I'm actually quite prolific. I'm doing, um, let me explain to you what I'm doing. I'm writing blog posts about almost every country we've been doing at least one blog post, sometimes multiple. Of course, I'm working sponsors like hotels and sightseeing, uh, tourism, so I got to give them shout outs on my social media. I'm also a podcaster just like you, Casey. Over the last year and a half, I've recorded 400 plus episodes of my podcast and you mean uh, different digital nomads, world travelers, uh, dad bloggers like yourself, Casey, you on my show. Uh, so I am quite prolific also on YouTube. I have uh, thousands of videos on my YouTube channel. It just hit 5 million plus views. And uh, social media. I'm posting on social media 
at least daily, sometimes multiple times a day. So I, I look at myself as quite disciplined. I am um, I have some priorities, right? My priority at the end of the day always is my faith in God. I happen to be a Christian. Second priority is always my family. I've got to make sure my marriage is nurtured and uh, healthy. If I, it's not, then I'm going to stop everything I'm doing and make my wife happy, as they say. Happy wife, happy wife. <laughs> Every dad will say, hey, this is... <laughs> this is something I'm told as well. Yeah. Um, uh, here's actually a good question because – go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I'm just going to finish my priorities there. Uh, so, of course, uh, faith and family. And then, um, you know, I'm uh, I got to nurture each relationship with the three children I have. So I've got to make sure that Rianne is always happy, um, which is impossible to always make them always happy. But, you know, in terms of, like, nurturing her, making sure I have uh, daddy-daughter dates, my son Ryan, making sure I have uh, – quality time with him. And then my little guy, Renzo, making sure I invest quality time with him individually, personally. And then is the business in terms of all these tasks. I, I do private coaching. I, I record, oh, another thing, I've recorded 11 different Udemy courses. Um, I have uh, four Kindle books now. So I am quite prolific in terms of content creation. Uh, and uh, I would say everything else is after that. The travel and all that is after. We got to make sure those three elements uh, working properly. If not, uh, we got to take breaks, uh, not travel as quickly, uh, slow it down, and avoid burnout. So I just wanted to emphasize, this, emphasize the whole priority management side of things. For sure. Uh, you bring up an interesting point, something I don't often get to discuss on the podcast, despite also being a Christian myself, is faith. Um, your Your travel is almost like a very wildly blown out missions trip. <laughs> where you're taking everything you believe and being able to apply it in all these different contexts and situations around the world. Um, how often does faith get to overlap with what's going on over in your world and what you get to do with your kids and also uh, interact with others around you? I'd love to say every single second of every single minute of every single hour of every single day of every single week of every single month of every single year, but that would take so, so long to say. <laughs> but in terms of how does my faith integrate into my travels, well, I have like this verse that is foundational to our travels. Uh, for those of you listeners who aren't familiar with the Bible, there's a book in the Bible called Matthew. It's one of the four Gospels. Uh, the chapter is 28 and the verses are 18 and 20. And in that book, it's actually uh, Jesus, uh, or you know, the person who we follow, who is talking to his 12 disciples. And he's telling them, hey, I'm going back to heaven to hang out with the Father, and I'll be back soon. But until I do come back, I want you guys to do, fulfill this great big mission. You guys are all fishermen and uh, tax collectors and lawyers, accountants, but I want you guys to go spread the gospel to the ends of the world. So these uh, 12, uh, you know, uh, raggedy uh, gentlemen, they ended up changing the world as we know it. Uh, you know, obviously, we know that story from history classes. Uh, they went from uh, Israel into uh, Europe, uh, the Middle East, uh, into Africa, and then they were, ended up, um, you know, from Europe, obviously, crossing the oceans. Um, sometimes through colonization, unfortunately, which screws up people's pr perspective of our faith, but uh, through uh, colonization, which is kind of under the sky, ki disguise of uh, missionary work, they, you know, spread the Christian message to Africa, to South America, to obviously North America, Canada, the U.S., and we have the world as we know it, which is predominantly Christian in those parts. And of course, we have the other religions, Islam and Buddhism and Hinduism. But in terms of how does this all apply to me? Well, I feel I'm one of those disciples that Jesus has commanded to go and make disciples. So I'm doing my part. But when we're traveling, we're very open about our faith. I do it in a very loving way. I'm not a Bible basher by any stretch of the imagination. And I really feel that travel has made me a more... Um, respectful and I, you know I, maybe I can use the word tolerant in the sense that I I want to respect other cultures but at the same time I really feel that um, Jesus uh, still the answer to every uh, person's need whether they're Hindu like I used to be whether they're Catholic like my wife used to be whether they're Muslim or whatever religion they might have I really feel the impact of Jesus would help them while retaining their cultural beauty and their music and their clothing and all the things that make their cultures amazing retain that yet um, accept this love of God. So that's my end of my little sermon. <laughs> but you asked me, so I had to answer it. But uh, we definitely incorporate that faith into everything we do. 
Well, I don't know I'm glad you answered it because, uh, like I said, it's not often that I get to talk to other Christians on here. We're, uh, I won't say we're a uh, dwindling uh, breed, but you know, it, I don't often see the intersect between uh, Christians and other various areas of content creation. So it's kind of refreshing. Thank you for that. You're welcome. And I agree. I don't see that either because uh, nowadays a lot of Christians are told not to share so publicly. So I'm glad you're giving me an opportunity to share so publicly. Not a problem. Um, here's a question for you from a more practical standpoint. So I know that when I'm packing to go somewhere with the kids, whether it's camping or cottage or any trips we're taking to other parts of the world, uh, they end up having a suitcase unto themselves of everything except the kitchen sink. We'll pack, you know, toys and clothes and snacks and so many things in there. Um, I'm assuming that with all the traveling you've done with your three kids, you may not have the same luxury to do so. So how do you guys deal with stuff? How do you guys deal with your packing? And what is it that goes with you everywhere or you've learned to do without in order to make sure you can continue on your journey? Well, every time we do bring that kitchen sink across customs, we get stopped. So we decided to leave that <laughs> behind. Uh, so we actually believe in the maximum travel light. Take twice the money, half the clothes. And when you're traveling, this is what you see at every airport. I almost laugh at it, Ian, when I think of it. When I, whenever I go to airport, whenever I go to bus station, I always see people overpacking. And it's just humorous, you know. Uh, all of a sudden, they get weighed, and then they're going to get penalized for overpacking. They got to take their socks and their underwear, stash them into their carry-on, and it just... Uh, it's almost like stand-up comedy, even better. And for us, we can travel the world as a family of five with carry-on only. I repeat, we can travel the world with five members with carry-on only. Two bags, period. I have a backpack, uh, which um, I carry my clothes in. I have about uh, five T-shirts, a couple pair of shorts, uh, my underwear, my electronics in terms of my laptop and all the charger kind of accessories. And uh, they're all in a packing cube the Ricky packing cube. And then I carry my um, two older kids' uh, clothes in two different packing cubes. So my son, Ryan, and Rian, uh, they both have their own cap packing cubes. Basic packing cube is a um, kind of like a vinyl uh, zippered <laughs> container where you put the clothes in and just keeps everything neat and organized. And my wife, uh, she has a rolly little mini suitcase that can be a carry-on, and she's carrying her clothes, and she's a, amazingly a super great packer, too. She only has, like, one pair of shoes which and then uh, slippers there. Uh, she's carrying, obviously, all of our baby kind of stuff, diapers. Unfortunately, we still are at the diaper state, so that can be actually a little bit heavier. But you can buy diapers, surprisingly enough, in every part of the world, they're babies. And those babies need diapers, so you can get them wherever you go, in every city, every country. And if they don't have diapers, you can just wash the baby in the in the, the sink. Speaking of kitchen sinks, <laughs> no, not kitchen sink, maybe like the, the washroom sink. So in terms of our travels, we have been able to travel around this world. Um, and the other reason we can do that is because we travel to hotter countries. Uh, if you travel to a colder climate, you can imagine you're going to have sweatshirts, jackets, sweaters, long pants, woolies, mittens, gloves. Uh, thermals, so we don't travel to cold countries. Um, if we can avoid them, we will. And we're sun chasers, and this is a little Christian uh, throw in here. We're sun chasers, S O N, and we're sun chasers, S U N. Well played, well played. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> you. Very cool. Okay, well, I'm I feel like I'm getting a um, a lot better idea of why you do what you do and how you do it. And it sounds like you've, you know, developed a system over time that's worked for your family, which is amazing. And yeah, again, I commend you on what you've been able to pull off so far. So here is, you know, we've been through 36 minutes of recording so far, and we haven't talked at all about the book, the book and why you're making it and what it's all about and what we can learn from it. Why don't you take some time to talk about your book since this is why we originally came together to record this podcast anyway. Yeah, all good at the end of the day. You know, for me, uh, I just love talking travel. I love talking family, faith. Uh, so for me, products are secondary. I can talk about my courses, my books, my coaching, but all of that's uh, so ir irrelevant compared to my big purpose and mission. And that's actually way more exciting to talk about so no need to apologize my friend i'm glad you asked me those questions 
Uh, so in terms of my book, uh, I'm actually a two-time Amazon best-selling author as of Father's Day of this year. I launched my first ever book on Father's Day of 2013. And that was a book where I interviewed 100 different dads, put it in a big form, and it became an Amazon bestseller in 2013. So now uh, this Father's Day, um, which was ironically enough yesterday at the time of recording this show, um, I actually became Amazon bestseller again, under the, uh, this time for a kid's book. And in between, I have two comic books. So let me explain my four books, and then we'll go into the last one. I have a book about marriage. I have a book about parenting. I have a book about fatherhood. And I have a book about family travel. So you can kind of see the similarity of kind of scope in terms of my big passions. I've also uh, I've turned my passions to profit, and I've turned my passions to products. Uh, so passion, products, profit, the triple Ps. Uh, so in terms of this last book series, up until this point, um, I was more of an, I would look at myself more of an adult nonfiction writer. And at, while traveling to South America, we were traveling with three young kids. And the question we'd always kind of reflect on is, will our kids remember this? Will our kids remember this? And for those listeners who know, yeah, you can probably imagine before four or five years old, you don't have many deep re recollections. Of course, they're going to remember our kids, you know, our parents took us traveling. We got to see a lot of the world, but they're not going to remember specifics. So I was constantly pondering that dilemma. So I decided for the sake of myself and my kids, let's create a kid's book so they can remember these memories, these moments, these experiences that we did as a traveling family. Uh, so I ended up just writing uh, this kid's book in terms of um, our journey to see every single country in South America. There's 12 countries in South America. We went to Brazil, Argentina, Paraguay, Uruguay, Chile, Bolivia, Peru, Ecuador, Colombia, Venezuela, Guyana, Suriname. And I put all of these um, kind of key places we saw, like Iguazu Falls, the Amazon. I put, um, you know, we uh, like I just threw in funny stuff. Like, we're in the Amazon. Well, there's Wonder Woman. She's from the Amazon. And Machu Picchu, that's a dream come true. And Ryan... He turned four in Chile. And, uh, you know, just like fun moments. So this at the end of the day was a book just for my family. It was for me to process kind of the journey. And then it was for my kids to um, have a memory to look back on. And then, uh, of course, at the end of the day, it's also for our other dads to inspire them to go to South America. Because the typical family destination is maybe to Disneyland, Universal Studios, maybe to Hawaii or Mexico. But most parents don't think... Let's go to South America. Let's do the Amazon. Let's go to Iguazu Falls. Let's climb Machu Picchu. That's not the first place people think of when they think of family travel. Well, let me be the change. <laughs> so let me inspire other families who never even considered South America on their radar to actually put it first and foremost. So now um, I had this big book launch team. I had an Amazon bestselling campaign, and it became Amazon bestseller. So this little kid's book, which was written for my three kids, has become an Amazon bestseller. It was actually the, the highest selling book about South American travel, even beating The Lonely Planet on Amazon on Father's Day, which is remarkable. I was actually number one, Lonely Planet South America was number two. I'm like, oh my God, we have hit the jackpot here. I beat The Lonely Planet, the Bible so of uh, travel. So that was an a, a, you know, amazing moment. And uh, the last thing I want to say about my book is that this is just volume one. So this is South America. Volume two, which I'm already working on, is North America, which we'll be talking about our great country, Canada, talking about Niagara Falls and uh, talking about the Rocky Mountains and seeing the polar bears and um, seeing, seeing all the national animals in Canada, like the beavers and the moose and uh, teaching them about the national dishes. Like <laughs> I don't know if it's national dish, but you know what I'm saying. And uh, the cat. Ottawa, right? So teaching uh, other people who are not Canadians about Canada, the U.S. Uh, most people, when they think of North America, they think Canada, U.S., Mexico. Well, Central America is technically part of the continent. So is the Caribbean. Um, so we're, uh, I'm going to be uh, releasing the next book about North America. Then I'm releasing a book about Europe. And then the next one will be Asia. Uh, after that will be Australia. Then it will be Africa. And finally, it will be Antarctica. So it's a seven-book series on, as you can imagine, the seven continents. All written for kids and uh, written from a kid's perspective into what will kids like to learn. They like to learn about geography. They like to learn about animals. They like to learn about food. They like to learn about sports. They like to learn uh, like little trivia questions. They like to learn about um, some tips 
and uh, the language. So I teach them like phrases in Spanish and uh, all the obviously the other languages which I'll be covering. So that in a nutshell, my friend, is uh, my book series. So did I hear that you went from Niagara to Ottawa and there was no Toronto in there whatsoever? Oh, yeah. You know, the center of the world? I might have forgotten to mention them. <laughs> no, obviously we'll mention uh, Toronto. Uh, we're going to mention Montreal, uh, of course, the French influence. We'll mention Toronto just for, you know, shout out to Casey. Maybe I'll draw you, uh, my illustrated door. <laughs> but yeah, we will do. How can we not mention Toronto? Otherwise, I'll have all of these Toronto haters burning my books and do book burnings on uh, Young East Square. I mean, we're we're pretty passionate about our city, is all I'm saying. <laughs> we won't burn your books. It'll be okay. So, wow, I think we've covered a lot, man. It's been a good chat about uh, your convictions, your products that come from the passions and the profit that's come with that. I ha- did listen to the three Ps. And uh, oh, I know what's next because you're going to Taiwan. Where, I guess, let's, let's close it off on a very poignant question. Um, you mentioned that no minors have gone and done what you're doing with your children right now. And when your kids do reach that age, like when they're in their 20s, let's say two decades from now, uh, what is it that you hope they get from this? What is it you envision for their futures, the hopes and dreams that you're trying to steer them toward as you take them on this amazing journey? Every parent will have the same answer to this question. I want my kids to be happy and healthy. But at the same time, if they're happy and healthy and completely selfish living in a suburb of Vancouver, being totally ignorant, of this world, I would have failed as a parent, honestly. So uh, I feel I most, okay, this is what will happen with most parents and kids. Most kids are gonna say to their parents, oh, we had a great childhood and my mom and dad are great, but I really wish we traveled more as a family when we were young. I say this when I was growing up, I wish we travel more as a family when we were young. I don't wanna be that family. I wanna be the family that said, my parents traveled too much with me when we were young, right? So I feel uh, at the end of the day, 20 years from now, this travel experience is going to shape their identities. And I feel this. I know you're a dad blogger. I'm a dad blogger. We're all dad bloggers. No, just kidding. You know, like at the end of the day, we as dad, dads, um, speaking to dads specifically, we have primary roles, uh, which is to be the provider, the protector. But one of my big um, kind of theories on parenting and especially father is our goal as fathers is to help shape our kids' identity. If we, as dads and moms, don't help shape the kids' identity, guess what's going to happen? They're going to look for their identities in the wrong places, from celebrities, from singers, from actors, from politicians, from a boyfriend, a girlfriend, from the school, from the peers, from drinking, from drugs. They are seeking and searching for identity. Um, And, of course, again, throw back to the Christian faith, their ultimate identity will be knowing who created them, the second most ultimate identity will be our, me and my wife loving them in terms of not loving them, um, in terms of just loving them without teaching them, educating them, and inspiring them to be better citizens. So no matter what they do, they can be working in a job, they can work in a business, they can be digital nomads. I don't care. I don't want them to be digital nomads because we are. I don't want them to be entrepreneurs because we have. If they're anything, I'm content as long as they're happy, healthy, and better citizens. That sounds like an amazing answer. Thank you for that. And thank you for the time you spent with me today, man. It's just there's so much that goes on in the thinking process and approach behind this that I don't think many people appreciate uh, all the components that have to come together to make this what it is. So, yeah, I think you're doing an amazing job, you and Anne, and I hope that you uh, continue well on your journey however long it takes and i hope to check in with you again sometime in the future maybe for books and i just want to give you a you know a acknowledgement as well i've been on about 30 to 40 podcast episodes and i'm usually asked the typical questions which i'm totally content with but you've actually done a great uh job of preparing these questions and asking me some really profound deep and uh you know, uh, questions that will ask, uh, consider your, cause your le- listeners to kind of reflect on their own life. And if, if I've helped even one person travel more, or if even one person think differently, or even help one person ultimately think bigger, I will achieve my goal by being on your show. So I just want to thank you for your great job as a host, your great job as a dad blogger, and you uh, just uh, being a great example of an amazing dad, amazing husband. So keep up the good work, my friend.
Thanks so much, Ricky. And um, where where would you like to point people to after this? Obviously, there's the book, and I'll link everything in the show notes and the blog post with the po- with the uh, conversation here. Is there anywhere else you would like people to check out to learn more about you, your family, and your journey? Yeah, there's uh, obviously my own website, which is daddyblogger.com, which links to every single thing I do, everything from my private coaching uh, to my uh, online courses to my Kindle books. Uh, to my virtual summits, to my YouTube channel, to my podcast interviews, uh, to all of my books. And uh, you can actually uh, just go to uh, daddyblogger.com and you'll see everything on there. Uh, so need to, no need to go anywhere else because from there you can go everywhere else. So uh, I just wanted to uh, finish on one thing too, um, this whole area of being a digital nomad and making money. I, I know for sure your listeners are going to be thinking this. I want to travel like Ricky ha- has and is doing, but I don't have enough money. So I want to encourage uh, all of you listeners and viewers, we do this journey with about, uh, you know, it's roughly about 2000 US a month, give or take, depending on the country we're in, depending on if we have to fly or not. But it's around that uh, ballpark number in terms of our cost of living. And in Vancouver, and I'm sure in Toronto, those costs of living are higher than that. So it's cheaper to travel the world than it is to live in Canada. Uh, so I just wanted to um, Maybe change your mind there too and uh, stop using the excuse we don't have enough money and figure it out. If your why is great enough, you'll figure out the what and you'll figure out the how. So if you want to know how we did it, make sure you check out daddyblogger.com. All right. Thanks so much for your time and everything, Ricky. It's been an amazing chat. Uh, Leave it off there, guys. Uh, Make sure to go check Ricky out everywhere he's mentioned. Daddyblogger.com is the resource for all he's up to. And I'll make sure to uh, share it out in the notes on social and we'll keep the good times going. Thanks. You're welcome. Thanks for having me on your show, everyone. Happy travels. And that's all for this week's episode as Ricky reminds us where there's a will, there's a way. Or at the very least, there's a Shetty family since these guys have been everywhere. They're a great reminder that no dream is too big if you're willing to do what it takes to make it come true. Nothing happens overnight, but it'll be all the more worth it when it does. As for me, I've got my own dreams to chase, so I'd better wrap this up and get back to the hustle. But before I go, what's your dream? Do you want to see the world like the Shetties do, or is your goal a little closer to home? Feel free to drop me a line on social media and let me know your thoughts. And as always, if you enjoyed what you heard, make sure to like, rate, share, and subscribe so we can make this podcast bigger and better. And tune in next time where we cover what I really learned about fatherhood this past Father's Day and the single mom parent blogger who's out to set me straight. We'll see you then. Bye bye Okay, everyone. Thank you for... uh, Wait, no. Scrap that. Hold on. Start over. (laughs) You already messed up. That's how it works. It's all good.